Dr. Bishop David Oyedipo, my brother. Shall we lift up our two hands to heaven and acknowledge Jesus? Let's celebrate Jesus. He's the reason we are here. He's the one blessing this conference. He's the one speaking life into our, our beings. He's the one impacting on our lives. He's the head of this church. Let's magnify Jesus together. Now we celebrate him. Thank you, Jesus, for this glorious time in your presence. And thank you for what you've been doing since last Sunday. Thank you for anointed ministries and the diverse impartations. Thank you for the set man over this ministry. Thank you for the grace and the anointing. Thank you for this great church. And thank you for your mighty presence here. Tonight, speak through my lips. Bless this great congregation. Bless all our viewers around the world. And let today mark a turning point in everyone's life. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Give the Lord a big hand, please. And you may please be seated. It's my privilege to be here tonight and be part of this great conference. I love Pastor Bill and his wife. I'll do anything, anytime, to be anywhere that he wants me to be. From the first time we met, I knew that God has something for us to do together. And I'm blessed, and I've been blessed ever since we began this journey together. Thank you, Pastor Bill, and thank you very much for being a friend. I love this church because it's word-based. I love this church because it is faith-driven. And I love these people because we are the same family. I'll be sharing with us tonight on what I've called unveiling the stronghold of faith. Unveiling the stronghold of faith. The same way the sun shines everywhere and the moon shows up in every nation, so also the truth triumphs everywhere. The Bible says, thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ and make it known by us the server of his knowledge in every place. The truth triumphs Everywhere. God is no respecter of persons. God is no respecter of nations. He said, now I know that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation. Acts chapter 10 and verse 34. Everyone that fears him and walks uprightly is accepted with him. Truth is a universal commodity. It delivers the same value in every nation of the earth. Truth is no respecter of nations. Truth is no respecter of races. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9, he said, He has redeemed us out of every tongue 
out of every kindred, out of every nation. Jesus, the truth, redeemed us out of every tongue, out of every kindred, out of every nation. So the truth has the same effect in every nation, among every tongue, among every race. God is not a racist. He so loved the entire world. He gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 12, the Bible says, now I know, he said, the same God, there is no difference between the Jews and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. So it's God of all the earth. No one is advantaged, no one is disadvantaged. Ignorance has been the greatest challenge of man. The ignorance of the truth will make a failure anywhere, anytime, any day. But the knowledge of the truth will guarantee your triumph wherever you are found on the earth. The truth will always deliver the same value. The truth will always deliver the same value. The same truth that brings us salvation, sanctification, is the same truth that brings us healing, deliverance, victory, breakthrough, prosperity, honor, glory, and blessings. Same truth. Same truth. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 12, it says, Christ has obtained for us power. And Christ is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except by me. And Revelation 5, 12 said, the truth has obtained for us power, riches, strength, wisdom, honor, glory, and blessings. So the same truth giving us access to these sevenfold amazing blessings of redemption. Same truth. Same truth. The word says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. So all that Christ offers us is delivered by faith. That's why we need to examine the mystery of faith that grants you and me access to this beautiful, wonderful inheritance that we have in Christ. Remember, let him ask him faith or let not that man think he shall receive anything from God. Nothing comes down from heaven except by faith. As free as salvation is, it comes down by faith. Every provision in redemption is only deliverable by faith. Without faith, it is impossible for you and I to assess our inheritance. And we have a sevenfold, all-embracing inheritance in Christ. Think of it. Power. Think of it. Riches. Think of it. Wisdom. Think of it. Strength. Think of it. Honor. Think of it. Glory. And think of it, blessings. There is nothing anyone is looking for under the sun that's not covered. Everything that makes for life and godliness is embracing there in that one verse. And the truth makes it available. The truth makes it available. So tonight, I'd like you to be very sensitive because God is up to something about your life. I have often said there is no mountain anywhere. Every man's ignorance is his mountain. There is no mountain anywhere. My Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. 
Lack of knowledge of the truth is what makes a victim. My people perish for lack of knowledge. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6. And Isaiah chapter 5 verse 13, he said, My people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. They are gone into captivity. I've done all I needed to do. But they are robbed of everything for lack of knowledge. They are held in captivity for lack of knowledge. So I strongly believe that tonight God is opening a new chapter to many of us sitting down here. The truth will always triumph in any place. Always triumph in any place. The truth will always triumph in any place. What is faith? Then we can begin to look at the stronghold of faith. Faith is clearly the most potent force in all the universe. Faith is the most potent force in the universe. Why? If thou canst believe. How many things? All, All things are possible to him that believeth. How is faith the most potent force in the universe? Because it confers divinity on humanity. Jesus said, unto man this is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. And he said, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believes. That means when you are operating by faith, you are operating in God's class. Mark 9, 23 and Mark 10, 27. When you are operating by faith, you are operating in the very class of God. Jesus said, Whosoever believes in me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do. So faith confers divinity on humanity. Whosoever believes in me, John 14, 12. The works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do. So faith empowers us to operate in the very class of God. Faith empowers us to operate in the very realm of God. Faith empowers us to handle what only God could handle. This is so important. And with that understanding, then we begin to find out why is faith so powerful and the saints appear so powerless. If faith is so powerful, why are the saints so powerless? Something must be wrong with what we call our faith. Something must be wrong. If faith is that potent, why are we so impotent? Now, faith is not a mere biblical principle, faith is our access to the power of God. Romans 1 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. So faith is not just a biblical principle. Faith is a spiritual means of empowerment. We are empowered Powered by faith. The woman with the issue of blood went after Jesus, taught the hem of his garment, and Jesus said, Power is gone out of me. And he said, Thy faith has drawn power from me, it has made thee whole. So faith draws on the power of God to impact on our life. Faith is not just a biblical principle, it's a spiritual platform for empowerment. When faith is at work, power. It's been released. Power is flowing. Power is bringing about changes. So faith is about empowerment for triumph. Faith is not a principle we try to use. Faith empowers us 
to command results. That lady was made whole by her faith, drawing virtue from Christ. So every time your faith comes alive, virtue flows from Christ to make you whole. Faith is not a religious theory. It is a mystery of the kingdom. First Timothy 3.9, he said, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. So faith is not a story. Faith is a mystery. And what is mystery? Mystery is a kingdom secret that gives you mastery. Kingdom secrets that confess mastery on your life. I have often said, I'm not surprised that we are saying what we see today in our ministry. I would have been surprised if we didn't see them. That means I was too sure they were coming. I was fully persuaded by the mystery of faith that they were coming. I knew far back in 1982 that we we're going to build a sanctuary that will see 50,000 people. So whatever we saw in the process is not important. I knew we we're going to build a 50,000 seat auditorium. Why? God said so. Yes, sir. While we had only one little rickety Volkswagen B2, I knew we were going to be flying. As far back as April 1982. Why? God said so. I'm coming. I'd like you to please understand this. That we are not serving a fake God. We are not serving a fake God. Every time faith comes alive, God's integrity is committed to deliver. He said, what, we believe not, what if you believe not, yet he abides faithful, he cannot deny himself. Faith is not religious logic. It's a spiritual weapon. He said, above all, taking the shield of faith, and you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16. Faith is not a religious logic. It is a spiritual weapon. Faith is not a biblical philosophy. It's an ever-winning spiritual force. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. It's an ever-winning spiritual force. Faith is not a biblical philosophy. It's an ever-winning spiritual force. First John chapter 5 and verse 4. That's why it's very important for us to find out what kind of faith is it that works. What kind of faith is it that works? If faith is that potent, why must we remain so impotent, so helpless, so frustrated? There must be something wrong with what we call faith. And we need to put that right now. We have always thought that faith comes by hearing the word of God. That's true. But it's much more than that. Faith comes not just by hearing the word of God, but principally by hearing from God. <laughs> Romans 10, 17. Faith comes not just by hearing the word of God. Faith comes much more importantly by hearing from God. Hearing from God. If you check the heroes of faith as documented in Hebrews chapter 11, 
80 to 90 percent of them came on that list by hearing directly from God. Hearing directly from God. Think of Abraham, the father of faith. The stronghold of Abraham's faith was access to the voice of God. Now the Lord said to Abraham, get out of their country, from their kindred, into a country that I'll show you, and I will there make of thee a great nation, I'll bless you, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And so Abraham departed. Most of us have been hearing the word, but we have not been hearing from God. Hearing from God is the stronghold of faith. No one hears from God and doubt him. The voice of God is the cure for the doubts of life. You can't hear from God and doubt him. No. The voice of the Lord is mightier than the voice of many waters. You can hear from God and doubt him. Abraham heard from God, get thee out of thy country. At the age of 75, he had no problem believing God. Because he heard him from God, infuses supernatural faith. You can't hear from God and doubt him. You can't hear from God and not believe him. You can't hear from God and not prove by acting on what you have heard. The stronghold of faith is access to the voice of God. All great stories in the kingdom, they are traceable to God told me. God said to me. God told me. God said to me. God said go. God said stop. God said move. God said go. Now that's all it takes. The voice of God is the stronghold of faith. Think of Moses. No normal person would dare an institution, a nation, as Moses did. But the voice of God makes you dare the undareable. The voice of God will make you dare the undareable. The voice of God will make you think the unthinkable. The voice of God will make you move the immovable. Because Moses heard from God. Now I've seen the affliction of my people. Come now and I will send you to, to Egypt that you may bring out my people Israel. Exodus chapter 3, verse 7 to 8. And he said, oh, tell Pharaoh that Israel is my son, even my firstborn. If you don't let my son go, I will kill your son because I must set my son free. Now, he was hearing that directly from God. Okay, Pharaoh is coming on that street now. Go meet him and tell him, Pharaoh, let my people go. No protocols. Now, you see, when you hear from God, it is irresistible voice irresistible. Now, hear what he said to Moses. Exodus chapter 7 verse 1. He said, See, I have made thee a God unto Pharaoh. God told him. So immediately, Moses knew his new status. He didn't approach Pharaoh as a man. He approached Pharaoh as a God. He said, See, I have made thee a God unto Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Now, think of it. Here they were by the Red Sea, and the Lord said, Why are you crying unto me? Tell the people that they go forward. Exodus 14, verse 15. So they saw the Red Sea, and they were moving because you can't resist the voice of His Majesty. Tell them that they go forward. Go forward to where? Into the sea. Yeah. <laughs> and the Bible records the sea saw them, it fled. <laughs> Psalm 114, verse 1 to 9. The sea saw them, it fled. The voice of his majesty is the 
cure for the doubts of life. If you can assess his voice, you are free. Think of it. The Lord spoke to Abraham and said, This is my covenant with you. You will circumcise every male born in your house and that is bought with your money. And without any fear, Abraham took a stone, circumcised himself and all the male born in his house. Because his voice is irresistible. The voice of the Lord is irresistible. Listen to me. And then God said to him, Take thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. And check out on the mountain, I will show you. And then you, circum- you sacrifice him there. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. Took his son and began to go. So when we talk about the faith of Abraham, we must understand the root of it. The voice of God is the stronghold of Abraham's faith. The voice of God was the stronghold of Moses' faith. The reason why our faith seems to be important today is that we have not been experiencing access to his voice like the heroes of faith that we know of. And tonight I pray that every spiritual deafness be healed in this room tonight. This is so important. God still speaks today. God still speaks today. He said, I am the Lord. I change not. You know what the apostles say in Acts chapter 4 verse 20? We cannot but speak those things we have heard and seen. We cannot but speak those things we have heard and seen. We cannot but speak the things we have heard. What did they hear? He said, and that voice we heard when we were with him on the mount. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 19. They heard the voice saying, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. And that made them unshakable in the face of challenge. We cannot but speak those things we have heard and we have seen. This is so important. Therefore, access to Rema is the bedrock for unshakable faith. Access to the voice of God is the bedrock for unshakable faith. Access to Rema is the bedrock for unshakable faith faith. Your faith and my faith stands to be shaky if it's not rooted in the voice of God. They stand to be shaky if it's not rooted in the voice of God. That's why tonight I want to spend the time we have trying to look at how to assess the voice of God. How to assess the voice of God. What does it take to assess the voice of God? It's important first for me to say this, that God speaks to us through a number of channels. One, he speaks to us directly. As it was with Abraham, with Isaac, you know, he said to Isaac, thou shalt not go down to Egypt. Dwell in this land. Your blessing is here. So the breakthrough of Isaac was rooted in the voice of God that he had access to. Genesis 26 verse 1. Thou shalt not go down to Egypt. You dwell in this land. And Isaac went forward. He was strong. He became very great. The Philistines envied him. He had, his faith was built on the voice that came to him. And God spoke to the man called Jacob. He said, what is thy name? He said, Jacob, thy name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince that has power with God and with man and has prevailed. And Jacob truly prevailed. 
from a person, it became a nation. Today we have the nation of Israel. The voice of God can change anybody's story dramatically. Anybody. So God speaks to people directly. God spoke to Moses directly. Everywhere you see, and God said, 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 and God said. All through the story of Moses, God said, God said, God said. And through the voice of God, he got three million people fed daily for 40 years. Through the voice of God, he had water, water supplies for them, including washing their clothes. Three million people. A rock was following them. A mystery. That was a mystery. Their legs were not swollen. Total health care delivery. There was not one feeble person among their tribes. I mean, there is so much in the mystery of faith. There is so much in it. But at the root of it is access to the voice of God. If you can hear from heaven, the earth will hear you. If you can hear from heaven, this earth must hear you. So God still speaks directly to people. Number two, very importantly, God speaks to us through his word. Behind every verse of scriptures is the voice of God. Isaiah 34 and verse 16 Isaiah 34, verse 16, he said, Seek ye out of the book of the law and read. None of these shall fail, neither shall any want are made. For my mouth it has spoken it, and my spirit it has gathered them. So every verse of scripture has the voice of God behind it. Every verse of scriptures has the voice of God behind it. 1976, the Lord spoke to me. From Matthew chapter 6 and verse, 6, verse 33, he says, Seek ye first my kingdom, and all these things that others are dying to get, they shall be added to you. Now, from 1976, September 12th till date, I have not had anything to ask. God has simply been adding anything I would need to me, and He has never failed once. Now, behind that scripture was the voice of his majesty. And when that voice came, it was so strong, I entered into a vow to make that my lifestyle. I've never had occasion to regret it till now. Seek ye first my kingdom and all its demands. And all these things that others are dying to get shall be added to you. Very simple. Behind every verse of scriptures is the voice of God. 1983, I was up in a meeting with my few staff and were praying. And the Lord said to me, from Psalm 34 verse 5, my son, you have two eyes. I said, yes. Can you make one to look up and one to look down? And I tried, it didn't work. He said, anytime you are looking unto man, never claim to be looking unto me. But they looked unto him and they were lightened and their faces were no more ashamed. Very graphic picture. That was where I came by the law of absolute dependency on God. Looking at no man for any help, including myself. Looking at no man. I mean, we have, God has given us a blessed ministry, but I am not the sponsor of that ministry. So I sleep like a baby. I'm not the sponsor. I have no worries of any kind on that ministry forever. I don't have no worries. We have about 11,000 workforce that draws pay every month. But I couldn't feel nothing because I'm not the one bearing that. The voice that came on the 9th of September, 1983, set me free from looking to myself or looking to people for help. 
Behind every verse of scriptures is the voice of God. In Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5 to 7. In the volume of the books it is written of me. So there are things written of you. When you get there he unveils it to you. That this is you I'm talking to. And then you are up running. Jesus found where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your eyes. There are things written of you and me in the volume of the book. And when the Holy Ghost leads you into it, the voice of God comes alive from it. Hear what he said in Psalm 29 verse 3 to 5. He said, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. He said, the almighty thundereth. The voice of the Lord is upon many waters. He said, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Now, let's look at what does he mean by water. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26. That thou mightest cleanse her by the washing of water, by the word of God. That means the voice of the Lord is upon the scriptures. The voice of the Lord is upon every scripture. The almighty thunders from scriptures to bring us out of any trouble. The voice of the Lord is there. So he speaks to us through scriptures. Number three, the Lord also speaks to us by the spirit. For when it's come, he would guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. John 16, 12 and 13. He speaks. The spirit of God speaks. The spirit of God speaks. The spirit of God speaks. That is God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. He speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. So we can hear the voice of the spirit. You know in Revelation 2 verse 7. Verse 11, and all the way through, he said, let him that have ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So the Spirit is still speaking to the church. He hears from God and he speaks it to us. He receives it from the Lord and he releases it to us. The Spirit of God is still speaking up till now. God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. Now, these are the three main areas that the Holy Spirit or that God speaks to his people directly through the word and through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, how do we connect with this? Now, God is speaking all the time. He runs a 24-7 system. But you have to tune in before you can hear, hear him. The TV set is working all the time, but you have to tune in to know what's going on there. God is speaking all the time, but how do we tune in to get there? Number one, to hear the voice of God, you must be spiritual. Because a natural man receives not the things of the spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.14 Neither can he know them because they are spiritually designed. The voice of God operates through a spiritual frequency. You have to tune in to get it. Only the spiritual can assess the voice of God. Only the spiritual can assess the voice of God. Only the spiritual can assess the voice of God. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, he said, I was in the spirit on the last day and I heard a voice saying, I am Alpha and Omega. I was in the spirit and I heard. I was in the spirit and I heard. I was in the spirit. So if you are not in the spirit, you can't hear the voice of the spirit. So you, when you hear a dog, you say it's barking. But another dog, he's speaking. <laughs> when you hear a sheep, to you it's bleating. But another sheep is speaking. <laughs> so you have to be in the sheep realm to hear what the sheep is saying. <laughs> in the same way, you have to be in the realm of the spirit 
to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. No, this is where our problem is. A can a can a man receive that not the things of the spirit because the affliction is on him, neither can he know them because they can only be assessed by spiritual people. He cannot know them. We had very interesting experience in 1996. They took me to where our facility now is in Lagos. I was very upset because it was off the town, completely off. I mean, Dr. Bill Wilson and his wife, they been there, off. I was very upset, intellectually tormented. <laughs> because it's contrary to every church growth principle I've ever read. How do you go into the midst of a jungle and you're expecting people to come all, all the way from town to come in there, for what? And so when we got there, I got upset naturally, but when we got there and I said, now, folks, let's pray. Father, thank you for all of the efforts inciting this place. What exactly are you saying? And the Lord said to me, this is the place. This is the place. You can't hear from God except you are spiritual. Only the spiritual can assess the voice of the spirit. And after hearing that, that was all I needed. I had no iota of doubt in any part of my system as to whether it will work or not. Not one. Last Sunday, we served communion to 164,000 people. Right in the midst of the jungle. Because God said so. Because God said so. It's so important for us to know that it's time we become spiritual. The church is growing increasingly carnal. People are not committed to things of the spirit anymore. That's why our faith has stopped producing. We must be spiritual. We must be spiritual. We don't have a choice. If you want to make the most of your journey, you have to be spiritual. You have to be spiritual. To be spiritually minded is life and peace, and to be carnally minded is death. We have no choice but be spiritual. The fear of the Lord, they say, is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy is understanding. We have to be spiritual. Unto us is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to them that are without, all these things are in parables. We have to be spiritual. It's one thing to be saved. It's another thing to be within. We have to be spiritual. We have to understand that the fear of God is fundamental to your fulfillment of destiny. We have to know that. We have to be spiritual. Number two, we have to engage in a quality work in the spirit. Quality work in the spirit. In Galatians 5.25, it said, if we live in the spirit, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 25, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. It's one thing to be spiritual. It's another thing to be walking in the spirit. It's one thing to be spiritual. It's another thing to be operating in the spirit. To be spiritual, you are there praying. You are there studying the word. But to be walking in the spirit means to be sensitive to the dictates of the spirit in your daily work. Sensitive to the dictates of the spirit in your daily work. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. So we need to be sensitive to walk in the spirit. We need to be sensitive. I remember many years ago, 1981, 
I was out to check on a friend and I couldn't meet him there. And as soon as I got to the door, I met his absence. He immediately talked to me and I said with my mouth, all things work together to the advantage of them who love the Lord. And the Lord said to me, almost immediately, my son, seek a quiet place. I want to talk to you. The entire thing we call the ministry today came from that encounter. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. I was naturally upset, but spiritually sensitive. Spiritually sensitive. And the Lord said to me, seek a quiet place. I want to talk to you. This whole vision came out of that simple encounter. This whole vision came out of that. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. 1986, we were about to start our Bible school. And then a week to the time, we had not gotten a facility for it. The property where we're going to use. And my wife said to me, the school is starting a week's time. Where are they going to resume to? And I replied humorously, is it your school? <laughs> and as soon as I said that, in faith, the Lord opened my eyes to a property in the city. And he said, that is the Bible school. And I got down to the office, I called one of the staff, I said, get in there, there's a property and so and so place, that's where the Bible school will be. And here what happened? This fellow got there to the property and met the owner of the property standing in front. And he said, hello sir, are you the owner of this property? He said, Jesus is the owner, I'm the caretaker. <laughs> he said, we need it for Bible school, for Bible school then it's free. <laughs> now, same day, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Yes. Let us also walk in the spirit. There are many, many spiritual people who are not walking in the spirit. They are only spiritual when it's time to pray. They are spiritual when it's time to study the word. They are spiritual when they are in church. But they are not walking in the spirit. And that's what makes all the difference. Because God can choose to give you directives at any time. In the morning, in the afternoon, in the night. I was in the bathroom when God said, arise, get down to Lagos, raise me a people. I wasn't in the prayer room. I was in the bathroom. <laughs> now, I was driving a car. I was sitting in a car when God said to me, the harvest of Africa is now overripe. Rush in and preserve it from decadence. I was in the car. I wasn't in the prayer room. I was in the church. When the mandate that is now blowing hot in 45 nations of Africa was delivered, I was in the car. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. It's time for us to understand that spiritual things only answer to spiritual people. Spiritual things only answer to spiritual people. Spiritual things only answer to spiritual people. Number three, we must engage in a lifestyle of praise. A lifestyle of praise. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 29 to 31. Thou shalt have a song as in the night. Isaiah 30, 29 to 31. When the holy solemnity is kept, he said, and the Lord will cause his glorious voice to be heard. And through the voice of the Lord shall the Assyrians be beaten down that smote with a rod. You shall have a song, and the Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard. You shall have a song, then you can assess the voice. You shall have a song. People are so depressed that there is no way they can hear from God. You shall have a song, and then the Lord will cause his glorious voice to be heard. Without a song, no access to the voice. Now, remember... In 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 15, Elisha said, bring me a singer. And as she began to play, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha, and the voice of the Lord came calling. You shall have a song. Then the Lord will cause his glorious voice to be heard. You shall have a song. Then you can now hear the voice. You don't have a song, you can't hear the voice. You don't have a voice, 
a song you can't have the voice you know Paul said rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice he said rejoice evermore I want you to know what is in joy if you are not joyful you can't assess his voice without his voice you remain a victim so rejoice in the Lord and again I say rejoice rejoice evermore the truth is this God's people I hear from God every day God speaks to me every day I've never needed anyone to encourage me in 30 years I've never needed encouragement in 30 years that someone will sit with me and say oh brother David don't get worried there is no worry around me in the presence of the Lord there is fullness of joy now let me tell you this the devil wants to depress you so as to rob you of God's presence he wants to depress you to rob you of access to God's voice. He wants to depress you to keep you in captivity. You cannot be oppressed until you are first depressed. Therefore, be free from every spirit of depression in the name of Jesus. Be free from every spirit of depression in the name of Jesus. And then, of course, number four, engage a lifestyle of prayer and fasting. I think that's where we have the problem down here. <laughs> Engage a lifestyle of prayer and fasting. Prayer is not a rescue system. Prayer is a lifestyle. Jesus said, when ye pray, not if ye pray. Matthew 6 verse 6 to 8 he said but thou when thou prayest so it's an issue of when it must be a program of your life when ye pray you when thou prayest and when ye pray now he went on in verse 16 of the same Matthew chapter 6 he said when ye fast but thou when thou fasteth now so Prayer and fasting, according to the teaching of Jesus, is supposed to be our way of life. A lot of people here have testimonies of the presence of God that comes on them when they stand waiting on him. Very strange. Until prayer and fasting becomes your lifestyle, you're far from access to this realm of faith. This realm of faith requires that you learn how to stand upon your watch and set yourself upon the tower to hear what he will say to you. And the Lord said, write the vision. And the Lord said, write the vision. Think of it. I was waiting on the Lord when the Lord delivered me from the tendencies for indebtedness. 1981. And I saw in my Bible, waiting on the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 15 verse 6. He said, The Lord thy God blesses you as he has promised you, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow. And I said, why? He said, because the borrower is servant to the lender. I said, but why Lord? He said, and you cannot serve two masters. We have to choose one and despise the other. I said, Lord, I choose you. October 4, 1981, God delivered me from the trap of debt. I have never owned a dime or borrowed a dime from any mortal man, living or dead, since 1981. God has been... When you wait on the Lord, he said, then shall your light break forth out of obscurity. Your light will break forth as the morning. We need a breaking forth. When we are away from the body, we are present with the Lord. We need to know how to be present with the Lord. Most of the things working in my life today, they came by waiting on the Lord. And it's working. It's working. 1982, I sat and I said, God, show me the secret of kingdom prosperity. And I took the Copeland's books and my Bible to wait on the Lord for three days. On the third day, light broke out. And the Lord said, my son David... My prosperity plan is not a promise, so it does not answer to prayers. It's not a promise, there's no respect for fasting. My prosperity plan is a covenant. Until your part is played, I am not committed. Direct Rema from heaven. 
And I said, what is my part? Why the earth remain it? Satan and Habesh shall not cease. I heard from God. I screamed and I said, I can never be poor. That was the day God took me out of any realm of poverty. Waiting on the Lord helps you to hear God clearly. Your hearing becomes more distinct. You can tell exactly what God is saying for you to do. And then you are up running. Prayer and fasting must become our lifestyle if we must enjoy God's plan and purpose for the hour. And as we close tonight, you want to hear from God because he speaks through his word. Engage in the search for the truth. Engage in the search for the truth on any subject matter. Engage in the search for the truth. God speaks to us through his words. If you are challenged in any area and you want to hear what God is saying, then pick on those materials that show where it is, and then you can find what God is saying. You know, he said, I have also spoken by the prophet and have multiplied visions and used similitudes through the ministry of the prophet. We'll see at chapter 12 and verse 10. So you collect materials that will help your understanding on the subject matter, and then God speaks to you through those materials to know what exactly to do. If you know what he knows, and you hear what he hears, you will get the same result that he gets. God is no respecter of persons. And God multiplies visions through the ministry of prophets. He multiplies visions through the ministry of apostles. You hear them and then God opens you up to what is next for you to do in life. My prayer today is that every one of us here will begin to explore the unlimited opportunities in faith. Faith has the answer to all human questions. Faith has the answer to all human questions. Faith has the answer to all human questions. Faith has the key to every door you want to see opened. Faith has the cure to every disease that may come on your life. Faith has the victory in every battle that you may ever be confronted with. As, as far as God is concerned, it is to every man according to his faith. And the stronghold of faith is access to the voice of God. You can hear him and doubt him. You can hear him and not believe him. You can hear him and not get results. The voice of God will always generate testimonies any day, any time, anywhere. The Bible said, and in his temple does everyone speak of his glory. In his temple, everyone speaks of his glory. Today, I've seen God. The Bible said, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I've seen God in practically all areas of life. I've seen God move in some strange ways because we are in the strange days of the church. These last days are strange days. Things never heard of are beginning to happen. And I believe we are all here today uh, between and the next convention. Some things will be taking place in your life that if you were told yourself, you will not believe it. We are in the strangest days of the church. Some fellow went in for a job, and as he sat down at the interview panel, they said, hey, we have hired you. You are already employed. Join us on the panel. He, he went in for an interview for a job. They hired him right there and asked him to join them on the panel. He became a boss. Right there. We are in the strange days of the church. And all we need is to be able to pick on this frequency. Working with God. Working with God. Working with God. We are, we are serving a faithful God. Our God is no fake. We're serving a faithful God. His presence will always make the difference. His voice will always put you on top of life situations. God is real. And God is here. God is real and God is here. God is real and God is here. God is real 
and God is here. God is real and God is here. God is real and God is here. Whatever he says, that is what he will do. God is not a joker. He means what he says and he says what he means. Whatever he says to you, that is exactly what he does. Tonight I pray that whatever thing might be stopping your access to the voice of God be broken down forever. As you pick his word, may his voice continue to thunder from the page of scriptures to you. And as you see that, you find things working. Every day of my life, God has directed my steps and I've seen the difference. It's effortless. It's struggle-free. You can be free from all struggles. It's effortless. It's struggle-free. We built our second university all out of the blessings of God, out of his house. Blessings of God. You have he said you don't have no, enough room to take them. Out of reserves. No noise, no nothing. You just find the buildings rising. A whole campus of 1,400 acres of property. All road networks, water, power, everything in place. Staff housing, everybody together. It, it, it's humbling. And that's when God speaks. You can be sure what happens next. When God speaks, you can be sure of what happens next. My prayer tonight is this. If it's working in Nigeria, if it's working in Africa, it will work anywhere it is. It will work anywhere it is. It will work anywhere. If it's working out there, it will work anywhere it is. If I were you, therefore, Lord, show me what you have shown that man. If you want to get the kind of result he's getting, just God, show me what you have shown that man. And then he shows it to you. He speaks to you. And then you are up on the same frequency. I knew that wherever Brother Copeland was going, I was going there. I knew that. 1982, I encountered him and I knew that. I knew I was going to wherever I was going. Today in Lagos, we have our own hunger at the airport. <laughs> Built, depth free, struggle free, strategically located. Strategically located. All by the blessings of God. Today we have close to about 30 secondary schools across the nation. Most of them are boarding schools and about 90 primary schools spread across the nation. All by the blessings of God. I can tell you this, just one word from God will bring the star in you out. Now the Bible said the Lord sent a word into Jacob and it lighted upon Israel. We are not asking you to give so the church can be blessed. We are asking you to give so you can be blessed. Yes. The church is a blessed body. He said, the glory of this little house shall be greater than the former. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, said the Lord. You are not giving as a sponsor. You are giving as a privilege, covenant child. You are too small to sponsor the kingdom. You are too small to sponsor the kingdom. Because God's project is according to God's size. You can't measure up. You are too small to be a kingdom sponsor. No. Don't ever mistake yourself as a sponsor. Our mission has no sponsor. The silver is mine and the gold is mine. See the Lord. But we get blessed along as he carries out his project on the earth. By committing ourselves to it. I knew giving was the way up. And I committed myself to it. By covenant. And bless God, I'm not down. I'm up. Yes. Yes. Some fellow said, okay, I was worth $150 million. I said, that's an insult. $150 million, that's an insult. I'm worth Philippians 4. 19. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. 150 million too small. That can't be. That can't be. He said, You shall lay up gold as dust. Is that 150 million? No. And check it out. Please check it out as I close. Check it out. Now, giving does not automatically result into prosperity. <laughs> you have to be spiritual for your giving to command the tongues. 
You have to be spiritual. Now, hear what he said. He said, receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth. And lay up his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you'll be built up. Then you shall put iniquity far from your tabernacle. Then shall you lay up gold as dust. Job 22, verse 21 to 26. Then shall ye lay up gold as dust. So God is not interested in your donations. It is four people that need donations. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. God does not need no donation from you. Your giving is a spiritual transaction. Not a donation. And when it's acceptable, the returns become obvious. It's so important. We need to be spiritual. Church is not a bank. Where anything you bring is, is acceptable. You must give it correctly before it's acceptable. Yes, There are many givers who are frustrated. Why? They are giving off spiritual frequency. They are giving off spiritual frequency. He said, you shall take iniquity far from you. You can't be cheating on your company and say you are giving. You can't be in drug business, destroying destinies, and say you are giving. These are all things. People need to know it. He said, it will purify us. Then will our sacrifices be acceptable unto God. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. So we need to have a spiritual root to assess our inheritance. Hear what Paul said. He said, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you inheritance among them which are sanctified. So you don't have inheritance without a commitment to sanctification. Come on now. You don't have no inheritance. Ask chapter 20 and verse 32. You have no inheritance except you are committed to sanctification as a lifestyle. Striving to please God in the spirit. Walking in love. Not robbing people. Then you are up running. We need to wake up to this. Can I tell you this? God is going to prosper the end time church in a most dangerous way. I know that. I know God will prosper. We are, we are in the golden age of the church. <laughs> Hear what he said. He said, who among you saw the glory of this house in its first estate? How do you see it now? Is, is it not as compared to nothing? But I tell you, the glory of this little house shall be greater than the former. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, said the Lord. Haggai chapter 2 verse 3 to 9. And then in Malachi chapter 3, he said, in that day when I make up my joys, they shall be mine. So there is a day of kingdom economy. There is a day of divine economy. Malachi chapter 3 verse 17. Now, you see, we are in that day when God's treasures will be unleashed on the earth to those who are truly serving God. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between them that serve God and them that serve him not. Malachi chapter 3 verse 17 and 18. So it's time for us to clean up. I say it's time to clean up. I say it's time to clean up. It's time to clean up so that our sacrifices can be acceptable to God. It's time to clean up. So that our tithes and offerings can ascend to God as a sweet smelling server. It's time to clean up. God receives my offerings and it shows in my life. God accepts my sacrifices and it shows in my life. The truth is this, I have never had to pray for food. I've never had to pray for payment of bills. I've never had to. When it's acceptable, it's acceptable. My prayer is this, that beginning from now, your offerings, your sacrifices shall be acceptable to God. My God said, if you do what I'm asking you to do, you will lay up gold as dust and the gold of offer as the stones of the brooks. He said, yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense and thou shall have what? Plenty of silver. Plenty. We are in the days of strange plenty. Strange plenty. We are in the days of strange plenty. 
By the grace of God, we're starting up our third university very shortly. Activity is about to kick, kick up because we want to remain the light of the world. We want to be part of putting smiles on the face of people. They need it. And if he sent us to offer it, let's go ahead and do it. And it's never failed once. Some strange things will happen by your hands between now and the next year convention. Individuals here, companies here, corporations here, God is going to visit you with very strange favor. Very strange favor. Just stay committed to God. Stay committed to the demands of the kingdom. Get excited. You're running an individual race. Get excited about it. And very shortly, it will be clear those who are serving God and those who are not serving him. This is your hour. This is your hour. This is your hour. God is busy decorating the church right now. God is beautifying the church right now. And you will never be left behind. You will never be left behind. You will never be left behind. Come and give the Lord a big hand of praise. Shall we all rise to our feet? Hallelujah. Shall we lift up our hands to heaven? Thank you for the voice. Thank you for the voice. Thank you for the voice. Somebody celebrate Jesus right now. Celebrate Jesus right now. In Jesus' name. Well, just in a moment, he said, I know my sheep and they know my voice. I know my sheep and they know my voice. Until you are one of his sheep, you can never assess his voice. The child of a man naturally assesses the voice of man. The child of a goat will assess the voice of a goat. Only the child of God can assess the voice of God. It's important to be saved. It's important to be born again. Going to church is one thing. Being in Christ another thing. I can tell you this. I was up in Orlando yesterday to see the one who led me to Christ in 1969. A short missionary lady in a very advanced age. She took me and led me to Christ by hand. 1969, February 19. What a day. And we're still celebrating her. We are busy trying to cook in her kitchen, helping her out. I mean, it's a joy. To be saved is real. Yes. Salvation is no makeup. Yes. Salvation is real. Yes. Salvation is real. Yes. Do I have a witness in the house here? Yes. Please get seated. Let me invite everyone that is not saved yet. Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be born again. Wherever you are, you want to be saved, you want to give your life to Christ, please stand to your feet so we can pray with you. What a night. Please get up on your feet wherever you are. In the various halls, the overflow facilities, please get up on your feet. Everyone that wants to give his or her life to Christ, you don't pay nothing for it. He paid everything already. Jesus already paid fully to your account. Wherever you are, get up on your feet, please, and so we can pray. Get up on your feet.